here to the Wednesday night services at the West Mary Baptist Church. And we're so glad you tuned in with us live on Facebook. Thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you for choosing to worship with us tonight. And uh, we really appreciate that. And there are so many other churches in Marion County that you could choose to worship with tonight, but we're glad you have tuned in to worship with us. So thank you so much. So let me encourage you to uh, get your Bibles and open them to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, uh, that's going to be in your first part of your Old Testament. If you're looking for it, you're going to have the, the five books of the law, Deuteronomy, then you're going to have the book of Joshua, and then you're going to have the book of Judges, and then you're going to have the book of Ruth. Ruth follows the book of Judges. Matter of fact, so many scholars will believe that Ruth was literally a part of the book of Judges until it was separated, uh, but it's still part of the canon. And so uh, Ruth lived in the 12th century B.C., so that gives you a little idea of how long ago this was. But it's a wonderful study. It's an inspiring love story between Ruth and Boaz. And also we, we see the, the price that sometimes is paid for when we make uh, wrong decisions and wrong choices. And we do not uh, rely on God's direction and leadership. Uh, in those, some of those choices and we see that sometimes when things happen to us and we go through trials and testings that the last thing we want to do is get bitter towards God and, and, and that we don't want to see and we also see in this we're going to see the providential care of God in the life of Naomi and, and you're going to uh, uh, identify with a lot of this that's going on and where they're at. You know, they're there in Bethlehem, they're in Jerusalem in that area, and they're getting ready to make a major move because of what's going on and what's happening. And uh, Imelech is going to make a, a wrong choice, and he's going to decide to go to the land of the Moabites. And he's going to go down there with the Moabites because of everything that's happening in Israel, thinking that sometimes the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And it is not greener on the other side of the fence. The book is, we don't really know who the author is that wrote the book of Ruth. It's credited to Samuel. The prophet Samuel is who they credit it to that possibly wrote the book of Ruth. But we're, we're not sure. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. It was there. It was part of the scrolls. They would read it. And uh, by the way, you understand that Ruth was in the genealogy of Jesus. Okay, She was the great-grandmother of David. Okay, so that gives you a little idea uh, how far back we go with this story and that. And so just to give you some little bit of background of the book and what's going on that we're going to be looking in for the next uh, several Wednesday nights as we uh, take a look at this journey through this wonderful love story of demonstrating God's providential care uh, for all of us, no matter what we're going through or facing. And uh, you're going to see a, a tremendous parallel right off the bat of 12th century B.C. was going through exactly what we in America and the world is going through right now. It's a beautiful parallel picture of that, of what was happening. And so uh, we just, uh, we're going to take a look at this tonight. Matter of fact, let me draw your attention. We're going to look at man's choice and God's intervention. Man's choice, and we can put it your choice, my choice, and God's intervention. Aren't you glad when God intervenes for us? We're looking at the price and the providence tonight in the, as we study this new series uh, uh, in the book of Ruth. And in chapter 6 and chapter 1, we're going to be in chapter 1 tonight only, but I want you to look at verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Now she's talking to Naomi, so it kind of give you a little idea what's going on. Or to return uh, from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Because you've got to understand all what's going on, what's happened, and, and where they're at. They're down in Moab, and what's going on there, and that's a bad place to be in. And now Ruth is going to journey back to Bethlehem, and, and she's telling her two daughter-in-laws to stay in Moab. And so uh, it's kind of what's happening and what's going on. And so uh, a little bit what's happening here. So let's take it. So we've read that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. 
We want to praise you and thank you for this wonderful story, this beautiful love story between Ruth and Boaz, which shows up a little bit later on, but we're going to get started in our journey as we see a parallel of really what's happening in the world right now and what's happening in our country where we live as we can begin to see the providential care of God even when we're going through the times and uh, difficulties and the stress and everything that's going on around us, there, there is still the providential love and care of God for his people. And so, Lord, we just praise you and we thank you. Holy Spirit of God, now please come and be our teacher and our guide as you will guide us into all truth. And you will certainly give us illumination, understanding of the, the inspired word of God. And then by all means, Lord, uh, give us uh, the wisdom to apply the application. Father, none of this is any good to us if we do not apply it. It's when the application takes place is when the Word of God moves and works in our lives. And so, Father, we want to just thank you. Help your servant now. Father, if you would, please, and give him that anointing in this hour. And we'll thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, our introduction here as we begin to take a look at it, and we can begin reading in verse number one, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, okay, uh, that there was a famine in the land. Or you kind of get an idea what's going on. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, uh, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now the certain man there is the man Imelech, okay. All right, and he and he and his wife, and his wife, of course, is Naomi, and their two sons, and so, and that name, uh, well, that man's name was Imelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon, Mylon. Okay, uh, they, they sound like uh, these two names of these two boys sound like we're in Star Trek with the Klingons. You know what I mean? Because of Mylon and 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 Chilon. You know, instead of Klingon, it's Chillon. You know, the, the, the Star Trek. Remember all that? Uh, you know, and, and, and Dr. Spock and, and you, know, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, man, what names here? Amen? And, and so we find these guys, and uh, they're in Bethlehem there, and they came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. And so we'll pick up a little bit here. First of all, this was a time period of 400 years, time period that's going on, uh, basically after Israel had entered into the Promised Land, Okay, under Joshua, and before there were kings, they were still under judges, okay, which they didn't like. Judges today, the Supreme Courts, our judges we have, and they could be our kings and our senators and our congress, you know, they could be our leaders politically, and, and, and Israel was being led by judges that God appointed, and of course at this time, and it, comes, it became a time of apostasy. That's what we're living in right now today, is a time of apostasy. The apostate church, the apostate believers that are turning from God, abandoning the faith, turning from the church, turning from the Lord, and it's a time of apostasy in the life of the nation of Israel. And what's going on when that happens? Warfare, decline, violence, moral decay, and anarchy. Sound like America? That's exactly what's going on in our country right now. I mean, exactly what's happening in America, but around the world. And so isn't it just interesting? This took place 12 B.C., and yet here we are nearly 4,000 years later and experiencing the same thing. And it's going on. Matter of fact, Judges chapter 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that was right in his own eyes. Is that not what's happening today? People just do what they want to do. The law doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, and, and we can go and burn down towns. We can burn down capitals. We can burn down city hall. We can, we can rumble. We can riot. And nobody does anything about it and there's no accountability folks that's nothing more than anarchy in the streets and see when there's no law and order that's what you're going to have and if that law and the trouble is we have law and order but that law and order is not being enforced and when it's not being enforced then you're going to have anarchy and you're going to have everybody just doing their own thing and violence is everywhere 
I mean, man, there's just a constant state of violence going on. I think this just past week, not this week, but last week, what the, that, uh, that group again, Antifa, got up there and I don't know, Oregon, one of the places, and, and burnt down the, the city hall or the Capitol or something. Nobody did anything about it. You know, just got to keep up the riots going. And, of course, this was all going on while the Senate and the Congress are in discussing gun control. And then there's a shootout they had. And then people were shot, and, 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 and we feel for those folks, and we pray for you and your families, and we're deeply sorry for the loss of your loved ones and, and the many that were even wounded out of that. And, and, and certainly we do not uh, uh, approve of that or condone, or, uh, and condone, we condone that completely. We don't condone it, we don't approve of it uh, or anything. We are totally, uh, that is not right. And we're sorry for your loss and for your hurt, and I pray that the Lord will comfort your hearts and the loss of, of your loved ones and family members of, of this uh, totally uncalled for uh, that's going on in our country. And uh, I'm deeply sorry for it. And so we can see that even nearly 4,000 years ago, folks, things haven't changed, have they? Same thing going on. We find that this was a time when the, that when there, when the repeating process of Israel's sin would continue. And you know what that means. Israel would go a whoring after other gods and idolatry, and they would be committing a spiritual adultery against God and their sin, and God would judge them, and then God would raise up another judge, and, and the blessings would come, and then here we go again, and the same cycle, and this just keeps going on and on and on, and here we go again. And the same thing's going on. And so this time they're under the judgment and what's happening, and so this is what's taking place, and we do see the same thing continually uh, going on. It was also a time of political upheaval, political upheaval all over the world in multiple empires. Man, what do you think is going on today? I mean, just a, man, you tell me the Bible's old-fashioned, not on your life. Man, it, it's as, as up-to-date as it can be. It's right on target, and it's right here with us. And, and it's right there, and, and, and this is what's happening. Uh, the political upheaval, environmental stresses. So we got happening right now. Uh, a, flurry, uh, a, fur a flurry of earthquakes is taking place. A deterioration is taking place of the major superpowers. This was all happening in their time, and here we are right here facing it today. Of course, this was all concerning Israel there and, and around Israel in that area and so forth. And, and it was a time of severe famine that overtook Israel. You see, because of Israel's idolatry and their spiritual adultery and their sinning and backsliding against God and turning on God in their apostate condition, God sent judgment. And he hasn't raised up a king yet because, uh, because Solomon's going to be the first king, but uh, Saul is, but we haven't got there yet. We're still under the judges. But God hasn't raised up a judge at this time. So there's, there's a political turmoil going on. There's, there's apostate going on. I mean, everything you can imagine is taking place. And God sends a severe famine. Now, a famine just doesn't always come with food. See, a lot of times we think of famine as being, well, there's a hunger strike going on. But what was happening there during that time, this famine happened to be widespread. It wasn't just affecting Israel. It was widespread. You know one of the other famines that was going on? A lack of rainfall. Hello? A lack, lack of rainfall was happening. Pestilence had come across the land. We just had one this past 18 months. A pestilence. I believe a judgment of God. Okay? A plant disease. Some type of disease that comes from a plant that God sent. And then, of course, there was warfare going on. Sound like what's happening today, doesn't it? I mean, boy, the Bible's right on target. And this is, what, this is how Ruth, the book of Ruth, opens up the story. And you go, wow, how are we going to get a love story out of this, man? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Well, hang in here. We're not there yet, okay? We've got to get going here to see what's happening. You see, how are we ever going to see the providential of God and the providential care of God? Well, we've got to start someplace, amen? And we've got to take a look at where we're at today, okay? Well, let's take a look real quickly at the, characteristic, the characters that are going to be in the story here. The characters. And we gave them there to you. Imelech, his name means God is my king. 
Naomi means the pleasant one or sweet one. Mylon, his name means sickly. He was sick. Chilon, uh, his was wasting away. Ruth means friend. And Orpha, sure names means neck. So these are the main characters in the story that we're going to be looking at and as we go along with this. And we find there in verse 2, we read that this man named Imelech, he decides to, to leave Bethlehem, and he's going to travel to Moab. Now it's interesting, he leaves Bethlehem, which is called the House of Bread, because that was a very agricultural land in that area, and they were noted for bread making. They were noted for their wheat and their barley. But you see, if pestilence comes and disease comes, see what happens when locusts come to a barley field or a wheat field? Devours it. You see, or a drought. Fire of these things. We're living in crunchy times right now. Our yards are dry and barren and brown and crunchy. It looks almost like winter when you drive around the county. You would think we were in the winter months, so we are turn, turns brown, right, in the winter months. All right, so then we find, again, uh, we find uh, he goes to Moab, and it's interesting. Here we have the house of bread, and mem- remember what Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Moab means the enemy of Israel. Why in the world would you want to go to your enemy when you live in the house of bread, and Jesus, I am the bread of life. And yet he decides, you see, now remember, Imelech is the husband. So he's got a wife. He's got two sons. And he's the spiritual leader of his family. He's supposed to be the spiritual leader of his family. He's the one that ought to be in touch with God and in tune with God and praying and fasting and studying and seeking God for direction and and decision making. But all of what I read to you, what was happening in the state of Israel and what was going on around Israel, he decides, well, hey, we've heard of some good stuff happening down in Moab, so let's go down and join with the enemy of Israel. Wrong move. See, wrong move. See, if you're not in tune with the Lord, church, if you're not careful, you're going to make a wrong decision. You're going to make a poor choice. And remember, with every choice we make, there's always consequences. No matter what, we're making choices every day. You make good choices, good consequences, poor choices, poor consequences. Always. And remember, we always reap what we sow. So you're sowing today, but you may not reap it for a year later. And remember, you always reap more than you sow. And you always reap how you sowed it. And so just keep those thoughts in mind when it comes to these things. And so, man, let's go down, to, let's go down and join in where they study, where they worship pagan gods. And they have this pagan god deity, uh, Chemosh, or whatever his name is, and he's the sex god of all things. Now, now watch this, because the, the folks, it's no different than where we're at right now. With, with, with America and, and, and the immorality that's in our country, and all that's going on in our country, sexual, there's a sexual explosion of immorality in our country that's going on. No different than 4,000 years ago. Now, if you study Moab and this God, and by the way, this God, Chemosh, or whatever his name is, guess who made the dumb thing? Saul did, or Solomon did. He's the one that erected it. He made it for him. Bozo. I mean, you got to think about that. I mean, it's, it's just, just unreal. I can't remember if it was Solomon or, 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 or uh, Solomon was a, that's David's son. So it would have to be Saul erected this thing and made this thing, okay? You can imagine this. Now, here's what they did in their, their worship. They, they worshiped by having orgies. Are, are you listening to me? Don't get too upset with that because the Church of Corinth had the same problem at the Lord's Supper, okay? Go read. Paul really got on to them about it, okay? They were having sexual ceremonies, this is what's going on down in Moab where Amalek, who is a Hebrew, an Israelite, who worships Jehovah God, decides, well, we're gonna, things are rough here right now. We've got famine. We don't have bread. We don't have food. We don't have gas. We don't have, can't go out to eat. We're out of toilet paper. I mean, you know, and, and we need to move on and we need to go over to Moab because they have Charmin and Angel Soft. 
Well, see, I'm, I'm trying to get you something to realize what's happening and, and, and see the, a little bit of, of, of this. And so, and, and then they had child sacrifices. Did you know that's going on right now in this country? And that is going on what's been happening in this country. That they're literally with all this child human trafficking that's going on and trafficking these children. And they are sacrificing these children and they are drinking their blood in their satanic worship right here in America. And a lot of it, I can't say what I'd like to say of where it's coming from and who's involved in it. So you see, 4,000 years later, same thing. But think about it. Then there were only a few million people we got 400 million people in this country, and we got 7.8 billion people living on the planet. So you can see how much larger it is of what they're doing. Matter of fact, oh, here it is. I knew it was Solomon. All right, I was right. I should have just read my verses here. Amen? First Kings chapter 11, verse 7. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and, the, and, Mo, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Do you see that? That's what's happening. So here's what's going on. So we find this, we're doing an introduction tonight, so just hang in here with me for a little bit, because we've got to lay the groundwork, we've got to lay the foundation and get an idea of all what's going on so we have a better understanding and, and a more appreciation of the love of God and the, and, the, and the providential care of God on our lives when we're living in a day and world which we're living in. Amen. I think about it, okay? Imelech and Naomi, they left with two sons. Mylon, no, it's M-A, but it's spelled M-Y is how it's pronounced. Mylon and Chilon. Okay, and that's not Klingon now, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, we know as we read the scriptures here, as we move along in verses 3 and 4, look at it. And Imelech, Naomi's husband, died. Now, I want you to start thinking about Naomi here now. And she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of... Another bad choice. See? Another bad choice. You see, because the father led them to Moab to a pagan place, pagan gods, totally immoral place of what's going on. And so now he takes his family down there and he gets his family involved in it. Now he dies, now Naomi's got two sons, and so they marry two Moabite women. So now she's got two daughter-in-laws, okay? Well, look in verse four and five with me again. And the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Okay, now verse 5. And Milan and Chilon died. Not a good choice, was it? Cost Amalek his life. Cost the life of his two sons. And the woman was left with her two sons. And the woman's Naomi, and their sons, and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the country of Moab. Naomi's got enough sense that, hey, it's time to go back to hometown. It's time to go back to Bethlehem. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. See, she'd heard now. See, 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 don't get ahead of God, folks. You see, the providential of God, they had a famine, they had all this was going on, they, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, so hey, let's pack up, let's move, and let's go south. Let's move out of the upper states, north, and northwest, out of the blue states, and let's move to sunny Florida, because we've heard it's freedom there, and people are free, and they live free. And there's a thousand a day moving in to the state of Florida. Because of what they've heard. And because we have a great governor. 
That's okay. If you don't like him, I do. I have the microphone. Amen. And you may have it too when we all go home. And you can shout and hear whichever one you like or don't like. Amen. So now the son's died. So now Naomi is all alone. And she's wondering, what in the world am I going to do? Who is going to care for me? I'm a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm a Hebrew. My hometown is Bethlehem. That's where I need to be. But I was an obedient submissive to my husband. And I followed my husband and we moved to Moab, down here to the land of the Moabites. There wasn't a place to be for anybody, especially a Jewish person and a Hebrew. It wasn't a place to be. The, 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 the worshiper of Jehovah God doesn't go down and worship pagan god deities of sex. Bad choices, wrong choices. You see, she wasn't, Emelech, as the spiritual leader, wasn't spiritual love to stay where he needed to stay and to trust God and to believe God that God would come through and provide. Amen. Now, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. My Lord tells me I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. I will stick closer to you than a friend, and I've never seen the righteous begging for bread, nor his seed begging for bread. Stay where you are. You don't need to move north. You don't need to move south. It looks bad in some of these other states, and I know it does. And I pray for them, and I feel for them. But you need to hang in here. God is still on the throne, church, and God is still sovereign, and God is still calling the shots. The rest of that crowd thinks they are, but they are not. They can't do anything that he doesn't give them permission to do it. Or that he allows them to do it. And if he does, it's for a purpose and for a reason. God always has a purpose and a reason for whatever he does, for whatever he brings our way. And that is to trust him more, to rely on him more, to count on him more, to have faith in him more. Not for us to run. But to trust the living God. So man, I mean, so now here's Naomi. The husband's gone. Both my sons are gone. Now I'm a Hebrew Jewish woman that's a widow. I have nothing. And I have two Moabite daughter-in-laws. What am I going to do? Naomi was now down there at the bottom of your page there. And number one, Naomi was unprotected. She now had no ability to provide for her daughters-in-law or for herself. Maybe some of you are listening tonight or watching or with us. Maybe you find yourself in the same situation. Maybe you find yourself destitute, lonely, no one to turn to, not ability to provide, unprotected. And what had happened, if you read the story here, she had become bitter against God. Why is all this happening to me? She even says so. If you read the story, God's afflicted me. God's left me. God's abandoned me. I mean, boy, she, she's bitter towards the Lord. Look down at verse 20 with me. Go over to verse 20 with me now. Let's see what Naomi had lost in verse 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, verse 21, and the Lord hath brought me home again, empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? It was Imelech that made the decision. She was submissive and obedient to her husband in the move, and now she's suffering the consequences of some poor choices and now she's gotten bitter towards the Lord and she's blaming him Amen. and if we're not careful church that's what happens to us we go through tests and we go through trials and testings and hard times and things happen and why has this happened to me why am I going through this and on and on and and I told uh, one of our men today I says just uh, somewhere in the message you'll get to shout hallelujah and I know what you're talking about because uh, I'm going through it I mean, everything under the sun is happening. 
and you can get bitter towards the Lord. Why is this happening? Why am I going through this? What's the purpose? You search your heart. You search, you search your heart before the Lord, and, and you seek the Lord and, and his wisdom in all of this. And God says, hey, listen, man, I've got this. I'm still on the throne, pastor. I'm still in control, pastor. I'm still a sovereign God, pastor. I still love you, pastor. I still care for you. I'm still going to provide your needs. You see, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. You're not going to go hungry and quit focusing on everything that you don't have and start focusing on what you have. Of course, the Lord knows how to hit me the hardest, my pocketbook. I have to remind him all the time. Have you, by the way, God, have you checked our computer over here? It, it, it's, since you know these things, have you checked my record? You have my blessing to check my record. Go right ahead. And I say, hey, now, Father, I didn't sow this, so why am I reaping this? And God says, I have a plan. I have a test. Don't fail the test, boy. Pass it. Can you praise me? Job said, though he slay me, yet will I still serve him and praise him? And everything under the sun's happening. I'm going through all these heart tests, thinking something's wrong with me. Teeth are falling out of my head. Teeth are breaking off while I eat tuna fish. You know, how soft can you get? Car, air conditioner goes out. Nobody knows how to fix it or what to do with it. Just one thing after another. What else? IRS wants some money. I mean, my goodness, you know. Look at what Naomi lost, all right, real quickly. Number two there. She lost her husband. She lost her children. She lost her security. She lost her possessions. She lost her status. She lost her reputation. Because remember, she was living in Bethlehem. Now she's down in the Moabite land. Not a good place to live. And she lost her closeness to God. You know why? Bitterness. Bitterness. Let's look a little bit here at bitterness. Bitterness destroys our ability to have clear vision and the price we pay for it. Acts 8.23 says, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So let me share four things with you a little quickly here about bitterness. Number one, bitterness had affected Naomi's ability to offer good advice. You see, don't go and seek advice from someone who's bitter. Now, I'm just telling you, you're trying to give you a little pastoral counsel here. You know, you don't go to someone who's bitter and acting bitter or, or blaming God for everything or whatever else and try to get advice because you, you're going to lose that because that's what she said in verse 8. What did she tell them to do? You see, rather than, than saying, hey, I'm going back to Bethlehem. I know that's where I need to be, but you all stay here in this pagan country. Wrong advice. See, she was bitter to the Lord. But she gave wrong advice to the two daughter-in-laws. See, she told Orpha, 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 and Ruth, you stay here. Why would you want to leave them in that land? Even though they were both Moabite ladies. Because you see, remember the sons married the Moabite girls. So she says, you stay here and I'm going back. Not good advice. Naomi was insensitive to Ruth and Orpha's grief. Look at verse 13 with me. Would you tarry for them till they were grown? Because, you know, he's talking about you're not going to have any sons, you're not going to have any children, and you're not going to wait for me because I'm too old to have children, and so you don't want to wait for you to have children, blah, blah, blah. Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. See, Naomi was thinking of nobody but herself. It's all about me. Folks, it's not all about you and me. This is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about his church and his work. 
and those we're trying to reach with the gospel of Christ. But her bitterness affected her to, make, to give good advice. Her bitterness caused her to be insensitive to Ruth and Orpha's grief. Because remember, they both lost their husbands. You know, there's got to be some grieving time here. There's got to be some time of sorrow. They've lost their husbands. What are we going to do, Naomi? We saw you've lost your husband, and now we've lost ours 10 years later. Naomi lost a perspective and could only see her own grief. You see, she couldn't see the grief of Ruth and, and Orpha, but she could, she could only see her own grief, what she was going through. Verse 7 tells it that Naomi could not see what she had, but only what she didn't have. You see, that's what a lot of us look at. You see, and that's why I've got to look at this as well. My car sat in the shop. It's our church car. It's our good car for nice clothes and, and clean smelling. And uh, hadn't put a dime in that car since the day we had it. You know, it's 14 years old. It's only got 84,000 miles on it. Never had a dime for the trouble. And then the, all of a sudden the air conditioner goes out. I was been back to the shop three times and a dozen trips and everything else. And poor Ted's hauling me all over the place. And it's still not fixed. And they still don't know what's wrong. So you know what I had to do because of this? I told Ted tonight, you're going to hear it in the message. See, I don't have that car. So I'm going to focus on the one I got that's sitting right out there. I don't have air conditioning in that one down at the shop, but I do have air conditioning in that one. So you see, instead of focusing on what I don't have, I'm going to focus on what I have. You see, and that will help all of us here tonight. Let's quit doing that, all right? And don't dare get bitter. And I'm not bitter towards the Lord. I just say, okay, God, what's going on here? What are you trying to teach me? I mean, you know, what's, what's happening here? You know, I'm going to rejoice and praise the Lord, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just aggravating. You know, it's just aggravating. All right? Let go of bitterness. Number five, we're wrapping this up. Let go of bitterness tonight. You see what bitterness will do. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You see, when your, your bitterness and my bitterness defiles those around us. So let's talk about what we looked at what bitterness destroys, and we saw what it did in Naomi's life a little bit, but let's look at it. Bitterness will destroy you. And I, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. Bitterness in all four areas. And I tell you, especially physically, bitterness will make you sick. You have all kinds of health issues. Let it go. Let go of bitterness. And how do I do that? Real simple. Begin the process of forgiveness. Begin the process of forgiveness. Well, how do I do that? Rediscover the humanity of the person or persons who hurt you. They're human. They make mistakes. They sin. They're not flawless. They're not sinless. They're not perfect. They have all kinds of problems and issues. You've got to go back and rediscover the humanity of that person that hurt you or said something. Because you really may not even know why or how come or what was going on in their life. Secondly, please, surrender your right to get even. Yeah, that's right. Surrender your right to get even, or you might with a forward slash, get back at them. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because remember, Naomi's biz bitterness drew her closeness away from the Lord that she had you don't want that number three revise your feelings toward that person revise your feelings towards them now you might sit here and say well how do i know that i'm doing that that process of revising my feelings towards that person a person that whatever that situation may be i'll tell you how you will know that you have obtained the miracle <laughs> i call it a miracle of forgiveness when you're able to ask God 
to bless them. You will experience yourself the miracle of forgiveness when you are able to ask God from a pure heart to bless them. Okay, so rediscover, surrender, revise. Fourthly, make the conscious decision to let go of your pain. Just doing a little counseling here tonight from the Word of God based on what Naomi, if you study Naomi's life and what went on. I can only give you a parcel of what we studied on this and all the different books I got it from, okay? Make the conscious decision to, to let go of the pain. See, forgiveness, church, listen to me, is not optional. We forgive to the extent that we appreciate how much we have been forgiven. Wherefore I say unto thee in Luke 7, 47, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You see, you're going to love much when you realize how much God has forgiven you. Recognize, lastly, recognize who is the ultimately in control and trust him with your life, your hurts, your pain, and walk in forgiveness and leave it there. Write this down next to that because you don't have it. Put Colossians 3.13. Colossians 3.13, I'll read it to you. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And you'll be on your road to forgiveness, to peace, to that walk with the Lord. Don't blame the Lord for what's happening. Why are we going through this? Why are we sick? Why are we hurting? Why are we in so much pain? Why are my finances on and on and on? Don't get bitter towards the Lord. He loves you. He's your father. He wants nothing but the best for you. God does not want to hurt you. God doesn't want to do anything that would cause you harm or hurt because you're his child and he loves you. Naomi, and she's going through a rough time right now. A lot of people are going through a rough time right now in this country, especially in the other states that we hear so much about. And I feel for them. And I pray for them. And I hope you will too. Not everybody understands everything. And everything's that some particular certain person is going to come and be the Savior. There's only one Savior. Amen. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he is coming. Amen. He is coming. But in the meantime, we still got to hang out on this planet for a while. Amen. And things may not get better. The Bible says the love of many wax cold. The Bible says that uh, things are going to get worse and worse in the latter days as we begin to approach them. And we are in them. But God is still on the throne. He's still in charge. But he has a purpose and a reason for everything that he does. Naomi needed to not get bitter at the Lord, get mad at the Lord, but to trust him with her hurt, with her pain, her losses. That God would take care of her. You see, if they had just hung out in Jerusalem a little bit longer, God sent bread was on the way. You see, the blessing of God was right around the corner. But they chose to turn and go in another direction. And oh, the price that they paid. That's a big price, lose your husband. Lose your two children. It's a big price. Lose your reputation. Lose everything you got. But you see, we have a gracious, loving, and forgiving God. Now, Naomi, Naomi, Naomi later on, she's going to come around. 
and Ruth's going to help it all about. Because Ruth is going to meet Boaz, the kingsman. Oh, what a picture. What a picture. My Redeemer liveth. Boaz is a picture of the Redeemer. Yes. Hang in here. It won't be long. Lift up your heads. Redemption draweth nigh. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these sweet, wonderful folks that came out this evening to take a look into your word and to study your word together as we took a look at Naomi and Imelech and the boys and the other girls. As we began to learn something, a lesson that you would teach us and have us to learn and to know. And Father, the lesson we learned tonight is not to get bitter. Let us not become bitter and let us not focus on what we don't have. Let us focus on what we do have. Lord, we didn't have a lot of rain today, but we had some. And we can focus on that and be grateful for that and thankful for that. And so many other things. Let us focus on what we have and what we, not what we don't have. And let us not get bitter. And let us not become weary in well-doing, because in due time you shall faint not. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we love you. Dismiss us with your love, Lord, your blessings, your grace. Grant us traveling mercies home now. Keep us safe. And we'll look forward to the Lord's day on Sunday. Or we'll look forward to the sound of the trumpet and the shout to come up hither for the rapture of the church. And the last thing I'd want to be is bitter towards the Lord and the rapture take place. Oh, my. Or bitter towards any other brother and sister in Christ. May we forgive them and love them as only Christ could and does and will. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
Jesus, the mere mention of his name can calm the storm, heal the broken, raise the dead. At the name of Jesus, I've seen sin-hardened men melted, derelicts transformed, the lights of hope put back into the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness turn to love and forgiveness, arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious from fever, and I've watched that little body grow quiet. I've sat beside a dying saint, her body rocked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet still it stands. And there shall be the final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ah, uh, so you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to the virgin maiden, his name shall be called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, there really is something about that name.